Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and thanks for tuning in, as always. And now we will resume our reading and discussion of Martin Luther's great Protestant work entitled Against the Roman Papacy, an Institution of the Devil. Pretty plain speech, even in the title, isn't it? Against the Roman Papacy, an Institution of the Devil. Just another way of saying the papacy is the Antichrist. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Scriptures, of history, and of prophecy. And the proof is unassailable that Martin Luther is giving us. Now, Martin Luther returns to the Pope's a boast that Matthew chapter 16, the two keys were given to Peter, and the Peter and that that Peter uh, gave them to the papacy. The papacy is the successor of Peter. That Peter is the rock and foundation of the church, and God gave to Peter alone the keys of binding and loosing. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And Peter gave that unique power to the papacy. Papacy claims to be the successor of Peter, the apostle. This is not true, as Martin Luther has plainly pointed out here. But in this particular case, he's talking about one of those two keys. He's talking about the golden key we see represented on the papal coat of arms as displayed on the papal flag. The golden key, according to Roman Catholic law, represents the Apostle Peter's power over spiritual things. His unique monopoly power over all spiritual things. And now that golden key is possessed by the papacy, being transferred by the Apostle Peter to the popes. And it is the popes and the alone who wield that golden key over all spiritual things. In other words, in plain language, that golden key makes the pope, pope alone, lord of lords. Okay? And now Martin Luther is going to explain how the papacy uses that golden key over spiritual things. He says, first, as heard above, the Lord, that is Christ, wishes to have his church built on himself. Not Peter, himself. The rock, that is, he who wishes to be a Christian should believe in him. Christ, and him alone. But what does the Pope say? No, it means that one should obey me and regard me as a Lord. Works like this save, and disobedience or refusal to consider me a Lord damns. Unquote. Again, the Lord, Christ, gives the whole of his sacrament to his Christians. Now here he's talking about the Lord's table. The Lord's, the Lord's table, the breaking of bread and the, and the drinking of wine, representing his broken body and his shed blood. And remember, it is his blood that washes away our sins. Okay? Again, the Lord gives whole of his sacrament, that is, the Lord's table, to his Christians. That is, both the bread and the wine are given at communion. That's how he gave it in the upper room with his disciples. That's how the disciples gave it to all of the followers of Christ immediately after Christ's ascension into heaven. They all partook of the bread and the wine, okay, the body and the blood. They remembered his sacrifice And we are to remember his sacrifice, both his broken body and his shed blood, until he returns. 
But what does the Pope say? No, says the fart-ass Pope. One element is enough for the layman. The whole, that is, both kinds, belongs only to the priests. Unquote. So, if you're unfamiliar with Roman Catholicism, then you need to take my advice and go watch on YouTube or any other video service a Roman Catholic Mass. Okay, it's not called communion necessarily, it's called the Mass. And that is where the priest elevates the wafer, that is the bread, the man-made bread. He elevates it and turns it into Jesus. It becomes the literal Christ. It, the whole Christ and nothing lacking. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. And they give the bread to the laity. But the blood, that is the wine, is elevated and consecrated, and it is drunk by the priest. And so the laity are denied the blood of Christ, that which represents his blood in communion. So the blood is only for the priests. And the bread, the broken body, is only for the laity. It, it's, it's sacrilege, it's blasphemy at its first. First of all, the priest doesn't have the power to consecrate anything. Okay? Let alone turn a piece of bread into the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ. There's no such thing as the real presence of Christ in the sacrament or in the elements, the bread and the wine. Those were given to us just to remember his sacrifice for us. We know our salvation depends upon his broke body and his shed blood, and one or the other is not possible. Our salvation is in his sacrifice, both his blood and his body, and the laymen participate in both kinds, blood and the body, in, this, in the communion table. The Roman Catholic Church is unique in this. It, no, by any stretch of the imagination, it cannot be called communion as Christ instituted it. It holds a higher respect for the priest than it does for the laity. And what did Christ say? Christ is the rock of the church and we are all brethren. Okay? So, so on its face, the Mass is an abomination. It outright denies to the laity, Christ's people, those for whom he died, it denies them his blood, his precious blood that washed away our sins. All right, that explains what Martin Luther says. Now, what else does the papacy do with this golden key, this sole authority over spiritual things? Martin Luther continues. He says again, the Lord wants to have his sacrament given to strengthen the poor consciences through faith. Okay? We have faith that that bread and that wine representing Christ's broken body and his shed blood guarantees us remission of sin. If it doesn't, then he died in vain, didn't he? Did he die in vain? No. It's the only sacrifice that God would accept. Only from a spotless, sinless perfection in Christ Jesus could we be atoned, could our sins be atoned for. No man can die for another man and wash away sins because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us are the spotless lamb required to remove the sin. But Jesus, though he lived in a robe of flesh like the rest of us and was tempted in every way like as we are, yet without sin gave his life a ransom for us all. His broken body, his shed blood for us all. And we are all partakers of the gift of and by faith we believe this. 
By faith, we believe this. We're not calling God a liar. Because to deny this is to call God a liar. And what hope is there to call God a liar? We believe by faith that Jesus died for our sins and washed away our sins with his own precious blood. And he said that he was going away to be with his Father, that he would come again and receive us unto himself. That we believe, we trust. God is no liar. Jesus did not lie to us. Our hope and our faith belongs to him and him alone. No one else can redeem us from our sin. No other act than Christ's sacrifice alone satisfies God's law and reconciles man to God. No pope is necessary. Pope came hundreds of years later. Okay? Our salvation is in Christ Jesus. Where was the pope when Jesus in the Garden of Eden offered a lamb, a sacrifice for Adam and Eve, and then, co- and then clothed them with coats of skins. Where was the Pope then? Where was the Pope when Abel, righteous Abel, offered a lamb on the altar, a sweet-smelling savor to the Lord? And why was Abel's sacrifice accepted by the Lord and Cain's was rejected? Where was the Pope then? to exercise his spiritual key. For most of the existence of this world, there never was a pope. But yet, the world acknowledges, by its actions, acknowledges that the pope wields this spiritual key and believes that the papacy is the successor of Peter, to whom alone was given the spiritual key of binding and loosing, and only he alone can exercise it. That he can shut up heaven or, 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 or open it as he pleases. Why does the world even consider this nonsense, let alone fashion the whole world economy on it, the whole world's spiritual economy on it, Martin Luther recognizes the grievous error of all this, and he's pointing it out to us. He says, again, the Lord wants us to have his sacrament given to strengthen the poor consciences through faith. But what does the Pope say? No, says the ass, uh, the fart ass. One should sacrifice it for the dead and the living. Okay? One should sell it and make a profitable business and market out of it so that we can expand our belly with it and devour all the world's goods, unquote. So what is Martin Luther telling us? The papacy, by its actions, says that the mass, that is the breaking of bread by the laity and the drinking of the blood by the priest, is not only for the living, but for the dead. In other words, you can say this Mass for someone who has died in the past and somehow merit their release from purgatory, where all good Catholics go to burn off or to make atonement for all their sins. Okay? That's what is believed in the Roman Catholic Church, that when you die unless you have an indulgence by the Pope or you're beatified as a saint by the, by the papacy, all good Catholics have to go to purgatory because in their religion, their sins are never completely purged. And it's in purgatory. So to get your Aunt Bessie out of purgatory, you have to pay for a Mass to be said in her behalf so that through saying the Mass... Merit might be earned and transferred to her to pay her debt in purgatory so she does not continue to writhe in the flames and suffer the pains of purgatory. So the Mass is not only said for the living, 
and not only earns merit for the living, but earns merit for the dead, too. See, the Pope claims that his golden key has power over heaven and hell. So, through the papacy, we can deliver our dead ancestors from hell. But there's a hitch, as there is in all of Satan's tricks. You have to pay for the mass. Money. And the more money, the more masses. Now, if you really loved your Aunt Bessie, how much money would you spend? You'd get her out of the writhing flames of purgatory. Well, you'd spend almost anything, wouldn't you? And that's how the Roman Catholic Church gets its wealth. It pleads poverty, but all you got to do is walk into the joint and find out how much they own, how much money they have. Have you ever taken a virtual tour of the Vatican? You can do so on the Internet. On, 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 uh, uh, I think it's YouTube. You can take a virtual tour. And you can see you can see the incalculable wealth just in St. Peter's Basilica. But if you add up all the other assets, as we learned in the Vatican Billions by Avro Manhattan, the net worth of the Roman Catholic Church is virtually incalculable. It's the wealthiest single entity on the planet. And Avro Manhattan gives the evidence. He lists as many assets as he possibly can. And it gives an equivalent value. Estimation. Because you have to estimate. The value gets so high, you have to estimate. The Vatican Billions, Avro Manhattan. As a matter of fact, that book is free online. You can read that book in its entirety from beginning to end for free on the internet. I recommend you do it. Either that or go to the First Amendment Radio Archives under Inquisition Update and listen to my reading and discussion of that book. I read it in its entirety years ago here on Inquisition Update to give my listeners some concept of the incalculable wealth that Rome has built from God's poor for nearly 2,000 years on this false mass system. The communion of the Roman Catholic is buying your way to heaven. It's called simony. Okay, the buying of ecclesiastical favor for money is called simony. And the reason it's called simony is because it, its namesake is Simon Magus. You remember reading in the scripture where Simon saw the apostle lay upon uh, people his hands and impart to them the Holy Spirit, right? And Simon Magus thought it was a very neat magic trick, and he wanted to buy it. He wanted to buy the ability, the power to impart the Holy Spirit to people. And the apostle, of course, perceived that Simon Magus was none of Christ. He was not a Christian, though he professed Christ. He was the forerunner to the man of sin, the son of perdition. He says, I see that I say, I perceive that thou art of the gall of bitterness and the fetters of bondage. Words like that smack of antichrist to me and they should to you too because that's where the spirit is driving the, the truth comes out simon magus and as we learned in simon the sorcerer simon simon magus simon the magi who attempted to buy the power to impart the holy spirit eventually wound up in rome and had a great following as a matter of fact, for centuries there was a statue erected in his memory uh, uh, at the end of one of the bridges that crosses the Tiber in Rome. And the author asserts, as do I, that it wasn't Simon Peter that started 
the Roman Catholic Church. It was Simon Magus. Nonetheless, that unique and famous characteristic of Simon Magus has passed to the papacy. And it swears that it has the power to bind and to loose in spiritual things. That he is Lord of Lord and that salvation must be bought on the, on the installment plan through masses. Said for both the living and the dead. Now I've talked about this many, many other times. Many of my people, my friends and listeners will consider this to be repetitious, but isn't repetition the best teacher? So Martin Luther is mainly saying in his own words, the Pope says that regarding the, the communion table that Christ instituted, that to be shared in both kinds by all of God's people, but in the Roman Catholic Church, the, 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 the so-called sacrament of the Mass is a sacrifice. Do we need a sacrifice, or is Christ sufficient? The Pope says, no, Christ's sacrifice was not sufficient. You need the sacrifice of the Mass, where Christ is sacrificed over and over and over. And this sacrifice is for the living and for the dead. And, of course, again, you must pay for these Masses to be said. You can't pervert the truth any more than the Roman Catholic Church has perverted the Lord's table. It's no longer the Lord's table. It's something entirely different. This is what Martin Luther is pointing out here. He says, again, the Lord wants to have his sack given to strengthen the poor consciences through faith. No, says the Pope. He says, one should sacrifice it for the dead and the living, sell it, and make a profitable business and market out of it so that we can expand our belly with it and devour all the world's goods, unquote. Now, if you, if you want to believe that this is just hateful rhetoric coming from Martin Luther and not the, the literal truth, all you have to do is read The Vatican Billions by Avril Manhattan. <clears throat> now, he says... Again, Lord, Jesus Christ, wills that whoever dies in the true faith shall certainly attain salvation. But what does the Pope say? No, one must first go to purgatory to atone for sin. For without works, the atonement for sin, which I bind or command, one must go into purgatory. Nobody but me with keys and masses can help there. Christ and faith can do nothing here, unquote. That's what all the decretals of the Roman Catholic papacy has said for centuries, that when you die, you cannot be assured of salvation in this blood. You must doubt and not only that, you must go to purgatory, purge away all of your sins. The sins that you didn't confess, the sins you didn't know about, the sins that you committed in act by accident, sins that you failed to confess to the priest, you must go to purgatory and pay for all of those sins. Grace avails you nothing in the Roman Catholic Church. The blood of Christ avails you nothing. You must obey the Pope, and you must earn your salvation, because only he has the key that can unlock purgatory and let your soul ascend to heaven. That's Roman Catholicism. That's what Martin Luther objected to, and will continue when we get back from the break.
Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support Inquisition Update and keep it on the air, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors it. Now, if you would like to do something for me, please pray. That's all I've ever asked for my listeners. Pray that the Spirit of God guides me and directs me, that I teach no lies here on Inquisition Update, that I teach only the scriptural truth. And uh, we all come to a common understanding of the Lord's grace. And now before I even continue with Martin Luther's message, believe you me, there is much more of the same kind of nonsense that we're reading here about the papacy making its own laws under the supposed authority of the, the, the golden key of binding and loosing, the spiritual key, that the Pope is Lord of Lords, that he dictates our consciences, makes all these laws. Let me say something. God has a law. We've all read it. We've all read it over and over again. Many of us can recite it from memory and could from a very early age. The Ten Commandments, that's God's law, and he forbid God's people to ever add even one jot or one tittle to it and not to take aught away from it. Let it stand the way God wrote it. And through that law, without adding to it, without taking anything away from it, we understand that we're all sinners. Every single one of us. 
We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one commandment that we haven't broke, because if we break one commandment, we've broken them all. We're guilty. That's the only thing that the law of God can do is to render a decision that we are all guilty. So at that point, what is our hope? There is hope. Grace. The unmerited favor of God. God simply forgets our sins. And he's able to do that because the justice for our sins was rendered to his son. He bore our stripes. By his stripes we are healed. By his shed blood we are washed clean. Blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sin. Righteousness is imputed to us. It's a sovereign decision of God. Guilty or innocent. The law of God is a mirror into which we can look to see every spot, every freckle on our faces. And no one can come to any other conclusion but that he's a sinner. So there must be an answer. And God gave the answer in His Son. Now, God will not impute to us sin. Because sin was imputed to his son, who atoned for it. Now there's nothing we can do to earn salvation. There's no law of God that condemns us because we're washed clean. Notice the severity and the mercy of God side by side. There's two systems of justice. One is the law of laws, and the other is the law of mercy. There's only two. So God's people cling to mercy. They have no other choice. Because we're wholly and completely condemned by the law of God. We have nothing upon which to depend but the unmerited favor of Almighty God. And that's gained through His Son. If you are in Christ, if you believe His sin was, His, His blood was sufficient to wash away your sin, then you believe God's mercy. And you've attained God's mercy. And blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sin. But, what if we add to God's law a jot or a tittle? Or take away from God's law a jot or a tittle? Or what if we, like the papacy, does away with God's law altogether and fills libraries with laws and papal bulls and... and Papal thunders and decrees and extravagantes and donation of Constantine and all the other laws of the papacy. And you know we're all judged by the law or we're forgiven by God's unmerited favor in Christ. But what if one claims to be the lawgiver. The Bible tells us what happens to those who take it upon themselves to change God's law. He said, whatever judgment you make, that shall ye also meet. In other words, if you're going to rise above the throne of Almighty God and start making your own laws and rules and regulations, 
you better be prepared to obey each and every law that you make. Because God doesn't allow us or anyone else to be hypocrites. To impose upon his people laws and rules and regulations that God did not impose. God reserves to himself the power and the authority and the sovereignty to be the lawgiver of all mankind. He won't share his throne with another. But he warns those who think themselves so arrogant as to exalt themselves above God's own throne and make laws and impose them on other people. If you're a lawmaker in this world, you better be shaken in your boots right now. Because if you make a law, a judgment, a law, you better be willing and able and ready to satisfy that law yourself. Whatever judgment you make, that shall ye also meet. If you're going to make a law, if you're going to rise above the throne of Almighty God, put yourself in the world as the lawgiver, and you make a bunch of laws either adding to or taking away God's law, you better be willing and ready and able to obey your own laws. Because you're going to be judged by them. You're going to be judged by those laws that you make. Whatever judgment you make, that shall you also meet. You're not going to make laws and impose them on everyone else and hold them accountable in pen prisons and penitentiaries all over the world and excuse yourself from these laws. You're going to be judged by your own law. Now, I'm perfectly happy with God's law the way it is. God's law condemns me universally. There's no hope of me satisfying God's uh, uh, acceptance by obeying those laws. I've violated them. And I, so I depend upon the law of mercy. But God doesn't offer any mercy when someone elevates himself to God-like status and starts writing laws for the world and then exempts himself from obedience to those laws. He says, again, I know it's repetition, but hear me. Whatever judgment you make, that shall you also meet. Now, where does that leave the Pope? And all of his priests, and all of his cardinals, and all of his presidents, and all of his queens, and all of his kings throughout the world. What are they all got in common? They're lawgivers, aren't they? And they exclude themselves from obedience to their own laws, don't they? See why I said, you politicians, you legislators, you better be quaking in your boots right now. And especially if you've imposed upon mankind unbearable laws with unbearable consequences for violating those laws, no mercy whatsoever. You better be ready, ready, willing, and able to obey each and every one you legislate. Because you're going to be judged by those laws. And there's no mention of grace. There's no mention of unmerited favor with God in that case. What of the Pope and all of his priests and all of his kings and queens and potentates and legislatures and congresses that pass, as a matter of civil law, Roman Catholic canon law and impose Roman Catholic canon law upon God's people? What hope or help do they have? Unless they achieve the mercy of Almighty God, the unmerited favor of Almighty God, they have no hope. 
But whether they achieve God's hope or not, the Bible says they will meet out for every law that they pass. They will, whatever judgment they make and impose upon us, they shall also meet. God's wrath resides perpetually on those who add to and take away from God's law and make themselves gods in the world and impose heavy burdens on men's souls and yet are not li- not willing to lift a finger to relieve any of that weight and yet exonerate themselves from any obedience to their own laws. The epitome of hip- hypocrisy goes on in every Every layer of government, every layer of government makes me quake in my boots just to think about it. Now, we're talking about the man of sin, the son of perdition, the self-proclaimed lawgiver, the single soul sovereign over all spiritual things and all temporal things. The God of gods of this world is the papacy. That's what he claims. That's what he's always claimed. What about all these pretended laws that he imposes upon God's people? I'm going to tell you the truth, right from the Scriptures. God says to the Pope, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, whatever judgment you judge, you shall also meet. Not one decretal of the Pope, not one Roman Catholic canon law will escape the justice of that God demands from the papacy for promulgating those laws and imposing them on his people. I'm going to say something that I've said many times before, but I don't think it really ever sunk in. When Christ returns, the Vatican will be a vast smoking hole in the ground. And you don't want to be within a country mile of it when Christ comes. Because all of these laws and all of these judgments that the popes have have imposed upon the world through his own legislatures, his own kings, and his governments, he's going to have to answer for every single one of them. And there's going to be no mercy. No mercy for the man of sin. Now, i got a question for my listeners. If you believe everything that I've said, and you should, what, what's in store for those of us who acquiesce to his authority? What shame do we bear for seeming to acknowledge this self-arrogated authority? I'll leave that right where it lays, and I'll continue with Martin Luther's book. It says again, the Lord wills that whoever dies in the true faith shall certainly attain salvation. That's right, Martin Luther was an eternal security person, wasn't he? Eternally secure in Christ Jesus. Listen again what he says. Again, the Lord wills that whoever dies in the true faith of Jesus Christ shall certainly attain salvation. You don't have to go to purgatory. You don't have to atone for your sins. If you believe Jesus atoned for the sins, then you don't have to worry about salvation, do you? It's guaranteed. Just as guaranteed as Jesus rose from the grave, you are guaranteed your salvation. Christ didn't doubt for a second that he would raise from the grave to life eternal, and I don't doubt for a second that I will raise from death and the grave and hell to life eternal. Praise Almighty God in the mercy of his Son. I believe in the law law of mercy, and the law of justice will never touch me. The grave can't hold me. Sin, hell, and the grave will never hold me. It can't. Or God would show disrespect to his son's, his, his own son's blood. My salvation is assured. If I ever doubt in my salvation, it's only my human weakness that can't conceive of a grace so complete, so assured, 
There's nothing in this life that is assured, but there is one thing that is assured, and that's the salvation of the saints of Almighty God and the precious blood of the Lamb. You can work your fingers to the bone. You can't be assured of anything. You can go to the Roman Catholic Church, participate in all the sacraments. You can't be assured of anything, and Rome even admits it. You've got to go to purgatory. There's no hope in the Roman Catholic Church. But I have hope. I have a guarantee. Though my flesh may doubt from time to time when I fall into sin, I know what the book says. The book says I am eternally saved in Christ Jesus. I'll never doubt my salvation again. Not in my spirit I don't. Where the flesh is weak, the spirit takes over. Martin Luther said, The Lord Jesus Christ wills that whoever dies in the true faith shall certainly attain salvation. But what does the Pope say? Remember, the Pope's going to answer for all of his words, every single one of them. They go against God's law. They go against what God said. They take away from God's law, and they add to God's law. He's become a law unto himself. What does the Pope say? No, says the papal ass. One must first go to purgatory and atone for his his sins. For without works, the atonement for sin, which I bind and command everyone else, one must go into purgatory. Nobody but me with the keys and masses can help there. Christ and faith can do nothing here. Christ, faith, and the law of mercy can do nothing for the Pope. No help for the Pope. But we have hope and help. And it's a guarantee. Written in stone. Martin Luther continues, he says again, The Lord Jesus Christ wills that the efficacy of his baptism shall remain as often as we repent, as long as we live here. What does the Pope say? No, says the fart-ass Pope. The baptism is soon lost. In other words, you can lose your salvation. That is why I have let it be preached that the holy monastic orders are to be considered as good, if not better, than baptism Although I myself, I myself, neither long for nor need such a baptism, unquote. I just love the passage that says, Whatever judgment you make, that shall ye also meet. Just love it when the papacy opens its mouth and condemns itself over and over and over and over again. It's assurance to me that I have rightly identified the papacy as the man of sin, just as rightly as Martin Luther did, just as rightly as every one of the Protestant reformers and most of Europe at the time, 500 years ago, identified the papacy and it alone as the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible, You can't get it wrong. You simply cannot get it wrong. You can hope till hell freezes over in a future Antichrist. You've missed the real one. History was written by him. Every nation was influenced by him. Every true Christian heart was tormented by him and martyred by him. Again, the Lord wills that whoever confesses his sins and believes the absolution should be forgiven. Okay? What does the Scripture say? He who confesses his sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You confess your sins, he is faithful and just. There's God's justice. 
The law of mercy says if you confess your sins, if you confess to your heavenly Father that you are a sinner in need, desperate need of his mercy, through his Son, the shed blood of his Son, the broken body of his Son, you will be washed of your sins and cleansed from all unrighteousness. That means no one can condemn you. Not man, and certainly not God. But what does the fart-ass Pope say? Faith does nothing, but your own repentance and atonement do, as well as recounting all of your secret, forgotten, and unrecognized sins. <coughs> no, you have to confess your sins to a Roman Catholic priest. And when you go into the confessional box of a Roman Catholic priest, it's his job to interrogate you exhaustively so that you may recall and regurgitate to him all of your secret sins, all of your forgotten sins, and all of your unrecognized sins. It's the job of the priest to pose to you question after question after question. Which sin? How many sins? How many times? To what severity? And even about sins that are so sick that you can't confess them. He has to draw them out. No, even those sins that are so regretful that you can't even utter them to yourself, that you must muster the courage to even acknowledge before God or man, you are to confess to that priest. For you don't be, you don't achieve absolution. If any sin is left unconfessed, if there's any secret sins or unrecognized sins, you have to go to purgatory to pay for them. That's what the Pope says. And he's going to have to pay for every single one of them. Because he professes to be infallible and does away with God's law completely and makes himself in the world God in the flesh and the sole sovereign lawgiver. He will meet every law that he has written and uttered. And I don't have to obey one whit of his laws. I'll see you Monday. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.